In the last video, I talked to you about some very big and abstract ideas about how, how science is done or should be done coming from philosophy. In this video, I want to talk about what your book calls the theory data cycle, which is a little bit more concrete about what scientists actually do and how this looks in practice. So I want to start with some important terminology. This is in your textbook. Um, first, what is a theory? So there's different definitions of a theory, but one definition, I think it's a pretty good one from your textbook, is a theory is a set of statements that describe general principles about how variables relate to each other. So a theory is just a set of statements about nature, about how things work. A hypothesis is a specific outcome that a researcher expects to observe in a study if the theory is accurate. And then data are records of observations. These are definitions from the textbook. Notice in everyday language, sometimes we use these words a little bit differently. Sometimes we say something as, quote, just a theory. Uh, but in science, a theory is as good as it gets. A theory is a set of statements about how nature works. And so a theory could be right or wrong, but there's nothing better or worse than a theory. It's just it is what it is. Okay, so your book talks about something called the theory data cycle. And the theory data cycle is a sort of abstraction of how the scientific process works. Uh, philosophers have called this the hypothetical deductive model, which is a sort of fancy term for this. Um, but the idea is that you can start anywhere in this cycle. Um, let's start with a theory. So a theory, as I said, is this sort of set of statements about how variables relate to each other. Um, it might lead you, you might look, if you're a scientist, you look at a theory and you come up with a specific question. Um, based on those questions, you design a study that's designed to help you answer those questions. You then formulate hypotheses, specific predictions about what you should observe in this study, if your theory is correct or incorrect, and you go out and you collect data. Based on the data, it might support your theory, in which case you go back and, and you say the theory has been corroborated or it's supported or what have you. Or if it doesn't support it, you might go back and either say, well, I need to change the design to learn more about what's going on, or you might go back and revise the theory. And so this has this general form of if this theory is true, then an experiment should produce a particular result, um, and you go about life trying to see if this is the case. Um, let me walk through a specific example to make this a little bit more concrete. So one theory that comes from uh, the science of learning and memory is dynamic retrieval. It's a theory that uh, talks about how retrieval of memory, meaning calling something from your memory back into your consciousness, um, isn't just like going and pulling a book out of the library and then you put it back and the book's the same thing. It suggests that the act of retrieval actually changes the memory. And from this theory, one particular question that came out is, well, if remembering something changes the memory, are there circumstances under which you can make people remember things and it actually improves their memory? Um, and in particular, does testing people on material that they've learned improve their memory for the tested material? And so in order to test this, a group of researchers, um, this is a real example, you can look up at the link in the slide, a group of researchers did an experiment um, where they compared retrieval practice, so they had people learn some material and then practice retrieving it by being tested on it. They compared it to other strategies that are supposed to improve memory, improve uh, our recollection of learned material. And their hypothesis was that the subjects in the retrieval practice condition would do better on a later memory test than subjects who had different kinds of strategy. And the data supported this hypothesis. So the researchers went back and they said this is further support for the dynamic retrieval theory and it gives us something really specific, which is an understanding of how testing improves material. This is something that I actually use in my teaching and other teachers use as well. We tend to think of testing as just a way to find out what students have learned, assign you a grade, but testing actually has the effect of helping improve your memory. So I do things like the concept check questions to help you learn better. Um, so this is an example of kind of walking through this theory data cycle. We go from theory to question to design to hypothesis to data. And as I said, you can read the details below. So within this framework, we can kind of fit in some of the ideas from earlier and talk about what makes for a good theory, because we can have all kinds of theories. As I said, a theory is just a set of statements. It could be incredibly validated and important, or it could be you know, whatever. What's a good theory? Well, Scientists do tend to, borrowing from Popper, 
like the idea of a theory that could make predictions, or sorry, that makes predictions about things that could be wrong. So if a theory can fit any possible pattern of data, then what good is it? It'll always explain everything. It'll never be wrong. That doesn't really help us learn anything about the world. So it has to have the possibility there could be some imaginable data that would, if we observed it, show the theory to be wrong. And that's this idea of falsifiability. Um, second, we tend to like theories in practice if they've been tested and supported by the weight of the evidence. Um, so sometimes the theory is brand new, no one's done a study on it yet. Sometimes people have done studies and the data doesn't really support the theory and then we should probably abandon it and move on. Sometimes there have been lots of studies and there's a lot of body of evidence and we say, yep, this is a really good theory, not only in this abstract sense of being falsifiable, but it's actually a good theory in the sense of being supported by evidence. And then a third criterion many psychologists and many scientists will talk about is that all else held equal, we like theories to be no more complicated than they need to be. This is this idea of, it's sometimes called parsimony, that if a theory is too complicated, it's difficult to work with. And so a theory that does all these things, that's falsifiable, that's supported by the weight of evidence, and also is fairly simple in a scientific sense, um, is also, many people will say that's a good theory. So besides this sort of theory data cycle, what are some other ways that people approach research? Well, one thing that some scientists do is something called exploratory research. And this has really been advocated within psychology by a researcher named Paul Rosin. And exploratory research often doesn't have a single hypothesis that's deduced from a well-specified theory. So it doesn't start at the top of that theory data cycle. Instead, researchers might go out and they might just have an interesting question and they want to explore the world and learn more relevant to that question. Uh, Paul Rosin has called this informed curiosity, and he said that a lot of research should be driven by informed curiosity. We find examples of research that was inform driven by informed curiosity. So one example of that in psychology is the development of a model called the Big Five, which is used a lot in personality psychology, where researchers said, we want to understand what are the important dimensions of personality, and rather than having a personality theory that we start with and we go out and try to test it, we're going to go look in natural language, we're going to look at the words that regular people use to describe one another, and we're going to look for patterns in how people talk about each other. And that's where the Big Five comes from. An example from another scientific field that Rosin talks about is the discovery of the structure of DNA, the double helix that you might have learned about in a biology class from Rosalind Franklin, James Watson, and Francis Crick. Um, and Rosin says that, look, they didn't start with a hypothesis that, oh, we have a theory, a mathematical theory or whatever that tells us this is supposed to be a double helix. They just knew that discovering the structure would be very useful in biology. And so they just went in and tried to use different techniques to see if they could describe the structure and see what it looks like without necessarily testing a theory that says, aha, it has to look like a double helix. They just went in and looked and that's what they found. And then it led to all sorts of good stuff afterwards. Another approach that scientists sometimes use is modeling. Uh, modeling involves creating formal models, equations, algorithms that can account for known observations or that can factor in assumptions, and then you see where it leads you. So an example in the last video that I talked about, a very simple kind of model is Fechner's Law. It's just an equation that relates the physical properties of a stimulus to our subjective experience of them. There are much more complicated kinds of models. Uh, sometimes models are used to test, to generate new hypotheses to test. Other times models are just used to see, well, what are the implications of a set of assumptions if we follow them out to their logical conclusion? Um, scientists and philosophers disagree and argue over whether exploratory research, like in the last slide, or modeling, like I've described here, are part of this hypothetical deductive model. So you can say, well, maybe exploratory research is just starting in that theory data cycle at the data part, and then we go back up. Maybe modeling is just a form of theorizing. Others say, no, they're fundamentally different. Um, and so there are these different kinds of approaches. Science is very pluralistic. We often take different approaches uh, to look at the same problem in different ways from different sets of assumptions. And when they agree, that's a really good thing. Okay, thanks for watching. Be sure and do the concept check. And this is the end of this week's module. I'll see you next week.